Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about America's long-running battle against illegal drugs. The so-called war on drugs has been waged now for more than 45 years. My guest today is Dr. Dina Perone. Dr. Perone is an Associate Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Welcome, Dina, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you for having me. Well, before we begin the discussion about the so-called war on drugs, we should talk about the specific drugs that we're going to focus on today, since there are a number of them and we have to keep it limited because of our time constraints. First, let's start with heroin. Heroin is actually the drug that uh, was the motivating agent for the, for the declaration on the war on drugs, and we'll talk more about that later. But heroin is referred to as a downer. It's an opiate, which means it's related to opium, and also the other opioid drugs, which are legal, such as OxyContin and Vicodin. And what we know about heroin is that when people take it, it causes them to withdraw and slow down and actually escape. And there was a, a famous statement by Greg Allman, the rock star from the Allman Brothers Band, who talked about his heroin addiction. And he said to him, it felt like a cat was inside his stomach. And when the heroin would wear off, the cat's claws would come out inside his stomach and that cat would start clawing its way until he got his next fix. When he got the fix, the cat's claws would retreat and that cat would turn into a little kitten which would go to sleep in the bottom of his foot. I always thought that was a very graphic description of heroin addiction. What can we say about heroin addiction? So heroin is no more addicting than any other substance. Um, however, with what um, one of the Allman Brothers talks about is something that many heroin users experience. Not all, but many. There are individuals who will use heroin and never, ever become addicted at all. Um, those individuals um, tend to be called chippers because they use recreationally. Um, <clears throat> but people have some serious problems with when it comes to heroin. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman um, was a you know, died of a heroin overdose. We have some other really um, famous cases, obviously from the 60s and 70s of people dying from heroin addiction. Um, but what we see now is a shift in the population of heroin users, and that is a lot, a, a lot linked to the prescription opiate abuse problem that we're seeing in this country now. And we'll talk more about that later. Let's move on to some other drugs, uh, specifically the hyperstimulants, which are mm -hmm. cocaine and cocaine-related products like uh, crack, cocaine, and so forth, and also methamphetamine, or mm -hmm. often referred to as crystal meth. Mm -hmm. And these are hyperstimulants, which means people take them for the opposite reason that they would take heroin. They want to be up. They want more energy. And exactly. people that have taken methamphetamine and cocaine often say, it made me feel very energetic, powerful, and even invincible. Mm -hmm. And so that's why people would experience those drugs. Now with meth, we know that there are some other problems with it, and it has some neurotoxicity to it, which can cause central nervous system damage and brain damage. What about that? So crystal methamphetamine um, has many adulterants in it. So we have to be really careful when we talk about some of the harms that, that illicit drugs have in general. Um, but methamphetamine has been shown more so than amphetamine to have that neurological damage. Um, <clears throat> what we want to know, though, is what kind of impact does it have on functioning? Now you look at our other substances, our illicit substances, you look at alcohol, nicotine, they also have um, irreversible damage done to our organs. So we want to be really careful when we talk about um, the harms that drugs have because all drugs have some level of harm. Mm -hmm. And with crystal meth, one of the other problems is that it's made with a variety of toxic yes. chemicals. Very and toxic chemicals that actually cause environmental damage damage to individuals living in the household or even in the surrounding apartments where those methamphetamine labs are. Right, well let's, let's move to marijuana, which is a much less harmful substance, I think overall, than the ones we've been talking about. A lot of people say, the advocates at least for marijuana, say oh, it's less damaging than alcohol. That's not to say that there aren't some harmful effects. There are with every drug, as you've mentioned already. But marijuana has become very popular. It's actually been legalized for recreational use in four different states, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. Yep. And a number of states, including California, have legalized it for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. But the federal government still considers it to be an illegal substance. Yes. 
Yeah. Are we going to see the day when it will become legal at the federal level as well? Um, I think so. Honestly, if you asked me this question five years ago, I would have said no way. I didn't even think we'd be where we are now. Um, but we're seeing a significant turn. I think the um, drug policy reform advocates have received a lot of attention. Um, we are definitely noticing that more research is coming out on the harms the minimal harms of marijuana versus other substances. We're also seeing that we can make a ton of money as state governments um, to tax the substance. And so I think the federal government is eventually going to want some of that tax, tax revenue. Um, the DEA still is holding steadfast that um, marijuana should remain a schedule, substance, schedule one substance, meaning that it has no medical benefit and should not be available. Um, but states are taking their own action, and luckily we're in this um, federalism system where we have, you know, states' rights and we can see some significant changes in, in drug policy. So the states, one by one, seem to be illegalizing it for one reason or another and they may drag the federal government with them exactly. along the way. Exactly. That, that's, I, I'm expecting that to, to happen. We'll probably see some, um, sl some states take, you know, a slower time in getting there. Um, I mean, Mississippi didn't um, legalize alcohol until 1966. So even though prohibition ended, you know, Mississippi was the last one to come. So it's, you know, it's likely that some states will be slower than others. And we'll talk about prohibition in a moment. But first, let's go into the actual war on drugs that I teased in the opening. And uh, the war on drugs was declared by President Richard Nixon back in 1971. So that was over 45 years ago. And at the time, he called drugs uh, public enemy number one. And the drug uh, that uh, motivated this declaration, as I said earlier, was heroin, mm -hmm. because soldiers, troops in Vietnam at the time, uh, President Nixon was getting reports from two congressmen in, in particular that indicated that up to 15% of the troops, or as many as 30,000 troops in Vietnam, were addicted to heroin. Yeah. And this horrified President Nixon, and he decided to take action, declare this war. What were some of the outlines of the war on drugs at that time? So Nixon is really our treatment president. So while he called it a war on drugs, he didn't wage a war like we have currently with the war on drugs. It wasn't heavily law enforcement focused. It was very treatment focused. Um, as a result, you know, we saw a lot of people get off of heroin uh, during that time. Um, what's interesting, though, when you look at the veterans um, from who had heroin problems, not while all of them were addicted, upon return. Not all of them remain heroin users. There were some significant studies done during that time, particularly Robin's study, showing how many individuals, once they came into a different setting, when they returned home, they no longer used heroin at all. But still, I think it's important to highlight that Nixon was the treatment president for the war on drugs. And as you say that, uh the treatment notwithstanding, it, it seemed that the interdiction effort, the, the war part, the uh, mm -hmm. criminalization, the interdiction and so on, uh, really took the focus in the media. And, and why was that? Um, that didn't actually happen until the 80s. So in the 1980s, that's where we saw that shift. Um, and that <clears throat> had to do with, you know, a lot of criminal justice policy shifting more towards a um, draconian corporal punishment um, movement that was occurring in the criminal justice system during that time. Among all of the legislators, Reagan was really big on the war on drugs and, and arming police officers and building the DEA. Um, and that's where we really saw that shift into a wage of that kind of war. And not to mention 1980s. Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. Oh yeah, the just say no campaign was a huge campaign. I mean, if you think about kids who grew up during that time, they remember those um, commercials about just say no, the commercials about this is your brain on drugs and the harms that drugs have. Um, and we really armed effectively the um, police and the criminal justice system to, to begin to handle um, the drug problem. So taking a look back then, 45 years ago when President Nixon declared the war on drugs, it had a treatment focus to it. But that eventually transitioned to where the, um, the main emphasis seemed to be, by the 1980s, the interdiction and, and criminality aspect of yeah, it all. Yeah, close to 75% of the budget for drug control that comes out of the president's office is for enforcement. 
So it's for international interdiction, domestic interdiction. Um, so the majority of our money goes into enforcement and only you know, about 25% goes to treatment. Well, when we look back over those 45 years that we've been in this uh, war on drugs, we see now that we're spending about $51 billion a year annually on this effort. Yeah. What have we learned over these 45 years? <laughs> Um, well, that we can effectively incarcerate a large number of people. Um, about 1,300, from 1980 up until now, we've incarcerated over 13, I think we've increased our incarceration of drug users by 1,300%. We've also demonized drug offenders. Drug offenders have greater collateral consequences on their life than murderers do. Drug offenders can't live in public housing. Drug offenders can't um, obtain welfare. So we've really been effective at militarizing our police and incarcerating large portions of, of the population. Um, but what we've learned, well, we learned that we actually haven't made much inroads in changing um, drug use patterns. We do still see the same percentage of people addicted to heroin. We still have high levels of drug use, particularly marijuana use across the nation. Um, we, really haven't made the impact that we would have hoped to have made spending close to trillions of a trillion dollars over the past um, 40 years. And the war on drugs was uh, not the first time that we took on this topic. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, prohibition mm -hmm. happened in the 1920s where we mm -hmm. prohibited the sale and distribution of alcohol. That lasted for about 13 years, 13, yep. 14 years, and then uh, we added the 21st Amendment which uh, repealed it. Why was prohibition a failure? Well, as, as most of us know, people didn't stop drinking just because we started to ban the substance. We've also created a large underground illicit market that was incredibly violent. Um, so we, again, the goal was to reduce drinking and that didn't happen. And we were smart enough to realize that we should change this pattern, right? We should do something differently. Um, we also the Great Depression hit right around that time and there was a large discussion about the amount of jobs that were lost as a result of the criminalization of alcohol. And so that was another big push. Um, so I think there we, we learned a lot. I, I'm hoping that we eventually get there, you know, when it comes to the other drug markets. Well, we have to take a break at this point. Oh, okay. And we'll continue this conversation when we come back. Stay with us. When we do come back, we'll talk about whether this is really a crime problem or more of a public health problem? Stay with us. There are many challenges facing our cities today. What can we do? How can we afford it? You can become a part of the solution by analyzing the problems, evaluating possible solutions, and implementing your plan. Work within your city, county, or state, or serve our country as a foreign service officer working overseas. You can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Dr. Dina Perone. And Dina, before we went to the break, we were talking about prohibition in the 1920s which was uh, repealed in 1933, and you had started to talk about why it failed and some of the negative consequences of uh, having prohibition in the United States, including increased crime, uh, lack of jobs, uh, things of that nature, and then in the Depression, it went away. Mm -hmm. uh, let's draw some parallels between prohibition and the current war on drugs. What parallels are there that are reasonable to draw after all these years? Well, we still have a large underground illicit market. Um, <clears throat> we also see the development of, you know, very wealthy and violent cartels um, that are happening um, to traffic the, the drugs, like we saw with the trafficking of alcohol. Um, we still see people with drug problems, like we saw still have people with alcohol problems. Um, we also saw the large um, mil militarization of police. Police b began to have significantly more power um, as we see now when it comes to, to, to drugs. Um, <clears throat> and we don't see the significant shifts in use that we would have liked to, have, um, liked to see when we criminalize a substance. Well, let's talk about the drug cartels because that's, that's all the rage today in terms of media 
um, coverage is the Mexican drug cartels. And mm -hmm. um, some people say that uh, their largest profit comes from marijuana, actually, trafficking marijuana as much as 60% of their gross profits. But they're also involved in a variety of drugs, including methamphetamine. We saw this famously in the TV series Breaking Bad. Yep. Uh, they're also involved in heroin and they're also involved in cocaine and all of those things. It used to be that we heard about Colombian drug cartels, now we hear about Mexican drug cartels. What about the cartels? Um, how have they diversified and how have they infiltrated the market so successfully? Well, when there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. Um, marijuana is one of their largest driving profit because of the um, it's so widely used. Marijuana is actually the most commonly used illicit substance in the United States. I think, you know, most, more than like close to half of all Americans have tried it at least once. So it is going to be a big profit driven product. Um, <clears throat> but they have diversified. They, you often don't see uh, drug cartels sticking to just one substance. They do dabble in cocaine and heroin. Um, they control a lot of the trafficking routes. So if any other cartel wants to get a product through, they have to work with another cartel to get it through to the country. We've also seen cartels expanding into the United States where we have um, members of cartels from Mexico now living in parts of, of the United States. And so there's a much clearer pathway to get the drugs from Mexico um, into the country. And they've been really successful. I don't know if you remember, um, they built tunnels. Um, they, they really use all possi um, possible avenues to get into the country. So air, boat, you know, ground, underground. They really go through um, multiple avenues to get their drugs across. And there's a demand and people will buy them. What about the high level drug busts that we hear about periodically and of course these are big events and they bring the news cameras out and they show these big piles of money. cocaine or methamphetamine and money and bales of marijuana and so forth. Yep. Um, are, are these busts successful in stemming the tide of, of drug distribution? Well cartels are like any other business, right? They write off, they kind of expect some loss to their product whether it be, you know, think about business, they lose it through shoplifting. Here they expect loss um, because of interdiction. So they will then, you know, make sure that they traffic a whole bunch of substances ac across, you know, the country in many different ways in order to get, you know, some of it across and expect some of it to get caught. So no, we haven't seen um, a drop in availability. I mean, even there's a great, um, annual study, the Monitoring the Future study, that asks high school students how easy is it to get particular drugs. And they haven't seen much of a change in responses given um, all of the interdiction efforts that we've had, which you wouldn't expect. You'd expect that some point people say, no, I can't get it anymore. And with all of those busts, you would also expect drugs to be much more expensive, you'd expect drugs to be less pure, right? Because they're trying to get more drugs into the country. But we haven't seen that. We've actually seen drugs gotten, heroin's gotten cheaper um, and, and more pure. And so the drug traffic has not been deterred because of these no. high profile busts? No. Okay, well let's talk about the demand side because obviously without the demand, the cartels would go out of business because they are a business even though it's illicit. Uh, so the demand has obviously maintained the same or grown. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit already about uh, the connection between heroin and opioid painkillers. Yep. What is that connection exactly from opioid painkillers like OxyContin, for example, and heroin use today? So what happened is we put a very tight restriction on prescription, on writing prescriptions for doctors, like doctors writing prescriptions. And as a result of that, it made um, OxyContin and other painkillers is harder to get. And so these users who have problems with opiates began to use heroin. And that was easier to get and, and in many cases cheaper. And so the pharmaceutical drug has led to the illicit drug use. Exactly. Which isn't actually that uncommon. We've, the history of opium and opiates has been the development of an opiate to um, reduce the need for an illicit, but now we're just seeing the pattern go the other way.
And you talked about this a little bit earlier and the fact that it's no longer just a big city problem, heroin. Yeah. It's now infiltrated into the suburbs. It's e even into small rural towns. Mm -hmm. We hear about it in places like Kentucky and Indiana, southern Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio in that tri-state area. They recently had a spate of, of uh, overdose yeah. cases that was very concerning to the local officials. Mm -hmm. It's even entered the, the uh, political campaigns talking about the heroin epidemic, if you want to call it that, in New Hampshire of all places. Yeah. So what about this idea of epidemic of heroin today? Is it really an epidemic or is it a cyclical thing and we're at the top of the cycle right now? Yeah, we, we have seen this pattern occur before with heroin where we've seen this heroin epidemic happening in the 70s. We've seen a heroin epidemic happening in the 90s. So this is just another, it's just part of that pattern. Um, what's interesting about this particular time, though, is you're right, it's now shifting away from an urban problem and into a suburban problem, which has shifted our conversation about the best methods of addressing the problem. So in the past, we've always imposed a law enforcement response, but now we're shifting. Even law enforcement who are responding are now using harm reduction methods. So we are moving into diversion programs where law enforcement is now sending people into treatment. Law enforcement is now armed with overdose prevention products such as Narcan um, to address the heroin problem. So it has really shifted our conversation about how can we best solve our drug problem. Um, and we're now moving to more of a harm reduction, less of a law enforcement, back to the treatment approach. And to characterize some of the stereotypes that were um, prevalent in the last 10, 15, 20 years, it was always thought that, uh, or at least uh, the stereotype was that, well, this is a problem that affects the inner city and ghettos and so on. And um, in terms of the white population, it tends to affect the trailer park exactly. with the methamphetamine in particular. But that's not the case anymore. Right. And you're, what you're saying is that having it move out of those stereotypical kinds of uh, imagery mm -hmm. actually is helpful to the overall effort. It's not good for those that are addicted, of but it's not. good for the effort to fight the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because now we... Um, you have people who have power who are saying, I don't want you to send, you know, my son who is the star of the football team to prison, right? There has to be another way to address this problem. And treatment is that other, is that other way. And so we're moving there. I mean, Seattle has this really great program. It's called LEAD, um, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And now you have cops going in with you know, locating the drug users and shifting them into treatment programs. Massachusetts did the same thing because they had a massive heroin problem in, in cities as, such as Gloucester, right? These small suburban areas. And so now they're looking at harm reduction or diversion and treatment as a way to address the drug problem and moving away from law enforcement and incarcerating drug offenders. What kinds of treatment programs are the most effective and are they affordable to the general public? So I'm not gonna say that there's one best program, right? There are a diverse set of programs. Some work for some, some don't work for others. The most common we have here is a 12-step program, which isn't the most helpful. Um, we know that cognitive behavioral therapies are very effective in addressing um, drug problems. We also know that therapeutic communities or treatment that is long-term and has some sort of aftercare is also much more effective um, than, than a 12-step program, for example. But again, there's not a one-stop treatment program that everyone is going to find to be successful for them. I mean, there are heroin users that quit cold turkey, never go into treatment at all. Um, and so for them, they don't even need treatment. So, as you but said... But it isn't... A, to go back to your question about affordability, mm -hmm. um, treatment is much cheaper than incarceration. So filling up the prisons doesn't solve the problem. Definitely not. What about this issue of, is it more of a crime problem? Because we have talked about the cartels, and let's not minimize the fact mm -hmm. that there's violent crime involved with a lot of this drug dealing but it's also a treatment issue because if you don't treat them, you're never gonna stop that demand or at exactly. least stem the tide somewhat. So is it more of a crime problem or more of a public health problem or is it actually a combination of the two? Well, of course it's a combination of the two because of drug, of, of drug cartels and drug trafficking. Um, but when you wanna look at the user, that's when you sh it, it's a public health problem. 
right? When we want to say we want to reduce your drug use, we want to make sure that you don't die, we want to make sure that you're not spreading diseases, right? That is a public health response to the drug problem. And you can look at other countries and they've been very effective at moving the policies away from enforcement and into harm reduction. Um, you look at heroin prescription programs in, in Western Europe where they've actually, the government provides heroin to long-term addicts and those individuals no longer um, share needles, they don't spread diseases, they don't, um, they're also not involved in crime because all, people also make the link that it's a crime problem because users end up stealing for their drugs. But we don't see that um, with, on the heroin prescription programs. We also don't see that among rich drug users. You don't see Philip Seymour Hoffman going out, you know, you know robbing, stealing, liquor, robbing a liquor store to get his heroin, right? That's not, that's not happening. Um, so once you move that element away from the user, um, then there's no longer that crime drug connection. So again, it's a cycle. Um, yeah. If you don't have the resources, but you have the addiction, you're going to find the resources to keep that addiction alive. Exactly. And you're going to find any way to do things that you enjoy. And if that's something that you enjoy doing, you're going to restructure your life in a way to make that happen. Dina, we've run out of time. Oh my gosh. But I want to thank you for being here today, and thank you for sharing this important research with us. Oh, thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.